could you give us an idea of what's happening in Mauritius, first of all, just on, on your particular part of neck of the woods? Thank you, uh, Savannah. Uh, good morning, everybody. I'm indeed pleased to be here. And uh, as far as Mauritius is concerned and the stock exchange of Mauritius, I think uh, the last 12 months have been essentially uh, focused on, uh, on the internationalization of the stock exchange uh, platform in Mauritius. In fact, uh, Mauritius, the stock exchange of Mauritius has a history of about 20 years. And during the first 20 years of its history, I think it's been an exchange which has essentially focused on domestic capital raising and domestic listing. What we've realized is that with Mauritius trying to position itself as a service platform for emerging regions of the world, namely India and uh, Africa, I think the time has come for the exchange to uh, move up the value chain of services that we're offering and come up with new ideas, and this is why we've been busy trying to internationalize our platform. So I'm just going to mention a few of the initiatives that we've taken over the last uh, few months so as to achieve this internationalization process. First, we uh, set up uh, about a few months ago a multi-currency listing, trading, and settlement platform, which would allow the Stock Exchange of Mauritius to list, trade, and settle different financial products in US dollar, in Euro, and GBP. So by doing that, we become the first exchange in the African exchange space that would allow an African issuer or an emerging market <coughs> issuer to come and raise capital through the exchange platform in Mauritius, list, and trade, and settle. What this means is basically, you know, as Duncan has mentioned before, there's a lot of interest for Africa for several reasons. And we expect that as Africa grows, many of the African issuers will be trying to tap the international investment community for capital. And, uh, and there's definitely going to be a lot of interest for, 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 from, for, from the international investment community because Africa is the last frontier growth and is growing at 5 6%. And people we know are looking for investment opportunities outside of the traditional markets. But what they don't really uh, like is being exposed to the local currency, uh, being exposed to the risks of, of the different currencies in the different African region. So in Mauritius, we offer a sort of alternative to that. We give them the opportunity to, uh, we give the African issuers the opportunity to tap the international investment community by issuing securities in different international currencies, and this provides the hedge. So we've been working on that. Another very important initiative that we've taken is we realize that Mauritius today is growingly being used as a platform for India and for other emerging regions. And we've seen a growing number of global funds and global business companies being set up in Mauritius. So we think that these, these uh, issuers could be, be it in the global, as global business funds or be global business companies, could be potential uh, issuers on our market. So we've come up with a listing framework that is very compelling and attractive uh, for these global business companies and global funds. And we, over the last six months, we've listed 12 international global funds on our exchange. So basically, our whole focus, as far as the Stock Exchange and Mauritius is concerned, is to go international. Come up with rules, come up with a framework, come up with a kind of uh, a platform that will be compelling and attractive to uh, the emerging re uh, issuers, namely in Africa and elsewhere. So that's, that has been our focus over the, uh, the last uh, few months, as far as Mauritius is concerned. So it seems to me that you've grown from the last year that we were, you were here quite a few opportunities. Yes. But what are the challenges that you're finding? As far as Mauritius is concerned or Africa in general? Both. Well, as far as Mauritius is concerned, I think we, our main challenges currently is uh, essentially uh, from an economic standpoint. Mauritius has had a, a development strategy which over the last few years has been essentially Eurocentric. And we have all realized, be it at the government level or at the private sector level, that with the crisis in Europe unfolding right now, and with absence of visibility in terms of how long this crisis is going to last, it's very important for us to try to shift our, our strategy and try to move to new markets. So basically, the government strategy in Mauritius is to open up to new emerging regions of the world. I'm talking about India. China, 
but of, co of course Africa is part of the, of, 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 of the whole spectrum of new markets that we're trying to aim at. And, uh, and the private sector too has realized that, so uh, we, we're busy trying to diversify into new markets. And in spite of the crisis that is, you know, uh, unfolding in Europe right now, we've managed to keep growth in Mauritius around 3%. But unfortunately, we're used to a growth environment of about 5 and 6. So, uh, of course, this is putting pressure now on the authorities to try to shift uh, their strategy and try to move away from what has historically been a Eurocentric strategy. Regarding Africa, I think uh, there's with what is going on in the rest of the world, as Duncan was saying, I think it's Africa's time right now. There's a lot of interest from international investors for Africa. And just to highlight what Africa represents, I would like to quote some statistics that I've seen recently uh, published by the IMF in its 2012 Wealth Report, where they're comparing the top 10 economies of the world in 2011 on a purchasing power parity basis GDP in trillions of dollars, and what will happen in 2050, which is only 40 years down the road. So in terms of top 10 economies right now, you have the US, of course, which is the number one with a $15 trillion GDP on a purchasing power parity basis, followed by China, and then Japan, and then you have the BRICS, the Brazil, Russia, uh, and the European economies. But when you look at the, 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 the story that will unfold uh, in the next uh, 20 to 40 years, amazingly, first of all, uh, the United States is toppled from, from its number one position, and it's India that becomes the, the number one economy on a purchasing power parity basis, followed by China. But the good story is that on the top 10, on the top 10 list, there are two African countries. There is Nigeria, which uh, in my, if I still recall the statistics, by, by 2050 will have an $11 trillion economy on a purchasing power parity basis. And another African country will be Egypt, which is, will, I think was number nine or 10 on the list, with a six or seven trillion dollar uh, uh, GDP. And none of the existing European countries that were on the top 10 figure on the top 10 list. So basically, the message is very strong. I think we are witnessing what I call a fundamental shift in, in, the, you know, in, the, in the world economy right now. And I think Africa will have a very important role to play to support the growth in China, to support the growth in India. I think African resources will be very much sought after. And I think that's why it's Africa's time now. And just to finish, I think to really untap, uh, to really tap the potential of African uh, countries, I think capital markets will, will need to have a very important role to play in that. Absolutely, I agree. Thanks, Sunil. Doing business in Africa, you can't afford to be without Africa Investor.